Hello, Kerry Magro was diagnosed with pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, a form of autism at age four. He has his master's degree in strategic communication and leadership from C.N. Hall University and recently received his doctorate at New Jersey City University in educational technology leadership. He is a speaker, best-selling author, movie consultant, and nonprofit founder. Today he will be joining us and will share his experiences on living with autism. Hi, Carrie. Hi, so nice to be here. Nice to have you too. So we're gonna start with your background first. And my first question is, can you describe what it's like living with autism spectrum disorder? Uh, it is very interesting because uh, when, when I was a kid, I was nonverbal. Oh, okay. And I was considered on the severe end of the autism spectrum. So mm -hmm. a lot of people who come up to me say, Carrie, how were you able to speak for the first time? And I tell them that it took a village. It took a village of support. And luckily enough, I was able to overcome a lot of my obstacles. And now today, I say that mostly living with autism is just sometimes a struggle with sensory challenges. But in terms of speech, I've been able to overcome a lot of my obstacles to have a career in professional speaking today. Yeah, that's exciting. I was gonna say like, what kind of um, help did you have for your kind of like speech or from being like nonverbal to verbal? Oh, speech therapy was phenomenal. Speech yeah. therapy, occupational therapy was also helpful uh, because I, I established such a rapport with my therapist. Yeah. Being an only child, it was f hard to find a specific connection with people. So mm -hmm. I think those two therapies helped me tremendously. But then I also got physical music and theater therapy as I was growing up too, which helped tremendously. That's amazing. Okay, so my second question is, could you provide a brief description of your childhood experiences? Yeah, I I was the kid who was kind of just scared of the world around me, especially mm -hmm. not being able to communicate with the people you care about the most in your life, even about some of your basic needs. It made life very, very challenging. I would lash out to try to get attention when I couldn't communicate. And as I got a little bit older, I realized that there was not a lot for people with autism like me. I, yeah. I didn't know I had autism until I was like 11 and a half, but I always knew okay. I was special. Mm -hmm. And I think my childhood experiences where autism were just trying to transition because my family were trying to just get the best therapies and the best support for me possible. So lots of transitions there in my childhood with autism. Do you think being an only child has something to do with it as well? Yeah, absolutely. We, we've learned so much in our community about how siblings play a huge role. Obviously, mm -hmm. parents can't see everything going on 24-7. Yeah. Uh, so having the support of siblings truly would have, I think, would have made a difference mm -hmm. in my life, especially uh, with dealing with difficulties with things like making friends and yes. isolation growing up. Okay. Um, what was your life like for you and your family after you received a diagnosis of autism? My, you know what's funny? My, my mom and dad mentioned this a lot to me yeah. uh, because obviously I was just four years old at the mm -hmm. time. So uh, even though I, I had vivid memories of just being able to see like other kids mm -hmm. uh, in, in when we went to see a doctor about getting a formal diagnosis, I would see them line up their toys yeah. and I would see them just having a lot of similarities to myself. Um, and then my parents kind of were just given that diagnosis. This We didn't know what PDD NOS meant or yeah. what it could mean for me growing up. So it was kind of deer in headlights during mm -hmm. that initial diagnosis. But if my parents have done anything for me, it's they never gave up and they continue to fight for me when the schools were <laughs> giving us challenges and the therapists were not what we were looking for at the time. So deer in headlights, but they never gave up. So the medical providers or like your physicians didn't give you guys like resources to kind of like explain what Exactly. You it was, yeah. you have an autism diagnosis and now you're out the door. It wasn't yeah. about any like, this is a nonprofit organization that could give you resources. There was no real blueprint towards early intervention and early access to care for me growing up. And it, a lot of the time it was just because the numbers of autism were not there in our community. Oh, okay, so. I understand. Okay, so my next question is, what's some advice you offer to parents who have a child with autism? 
uh, stretch, stretch them as much as humanly possible. Yeah. You have to meet a child where they are in their mm -hmm. own development to truly maximize their potential. So one of the things I say is that you need to remember to stretch these kids, mm -hmm. look at the possibilities and the talents that they have, use that as reward systems to mm -hmm. help them through some of the therapies they're receiving at the time, and just never, never stop trying to stretch your kids to live the best life they can. That's really good advice. Um, there seems to be support in programming for children on the autism spectrum, but when they turn 21, it seems the support and services are minimal. What do you think educators and allied health providers should be planning for as children become adults and needed continued supports and services? Tell me about it. <laughs> it's, it's quite a struggle uh, because one of the things we talk about in, in our profession of speaking is what happens when the school bus stops coming at age 21. Yeah. And I know so many parents today who have adults, both severe and high functioning, who are on wait lists for countless services. Mm -hmm. What we need to do as a society is we need to encourage local legislators, but also educators, to understand the purpose of uh, adult with autism services. Mm -hmm. Doing things to save up for them once they reach adulthood, but yeah. also being able to provide more federal funding towards actually providing support groups and other services for our adult population. Because in the next decade, 500,000 individuals with autism will reach adulthood. We need to be ready for them. Yeah. Um, what may you encourage parents and guardians to plan for as your child with autism gets older? So I know that you said um, to kind of get some resources ready for them as well, like in the future, like what else would you include in that? Peer mentoring. De definitely more than anything. I didn't have any role models uh, growing up who were on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. So I, when I found out I had autism, I was kind of like, who do I look up to? Who, yes. who do I see myself uh, potentially being in the future? Mm -hmm. And I wish now that the kids who are growing up have positive peer role models that they could look up to, not only individuals with autism, but mm -hmm. individuals in their own community who have really gone above and beyond to progress and live the best life they can possible. So I guess this would go in with like the realm of like stretching the kid in, yeah. kind of mm -hmm. bringing them with other people. Well, it, just... it, it, it's so important because we as a society are very much into digital media and social media, mm -hmm. and a lot of celebrities nowadays yeah. are bullies. Mm -hmm. And a lot of celebrities today are just not very nice people in, mm -hmm. in, in general. And a lot of the times I see a kid with autism who's isolated from, from the world around them and just looking at a reality TV show and then mm -hmm. be, seeing like this celebrity out until 2, 3 a.m., yeah. like not supporting their family. And I just think to myself, if we don't establish peer positive role models for all of our kids, mm -hmm. who will they become? Who, what will they reflect on once they become adults? Yes. Um, so now we're gonna talk about your high school and your transition. Yes. Um, so my question is, how did your experience in high school differ from your experience in college? How is it different? I think the biggest thing was that in high school, I was in a program for only 160 kids, all mm -hmm. with special needs. Okay. And I, it was always very hands-on mm -hmm. uh, and supportive. Mm -hmm. And once I got to college, that transition was the fact that I had an IEP in high school and I didn't have an IEP in college. And I didn't realize that I wasn't getting an IEP in college, which kind of left me deer in headlights being yeah. like, what am I supposed to do? What, how am I supposed to get the supports that helped me achieve in high school mm -hmm. and get that at the college level? So I, I think one of the biggest differences in high school and, and college was simply having that support and then going into a college campus where even though I disclosed my disability, uh, to our disability support system, I really didn't know how to go about self-advocating for myself to actually go about getting the stuff I need to succeed in my academics. Okay. And then, um, were you at all concerned about the transition from high school to college? If so, could you name the specific concerns? I, I think the biggest thing was I was nervous about being at a college campus where I knew no one for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, I made my first friend when I was 14. So just when I was in eighth grade and it was life changing for me. Mm -hmm. uh, growing up feeling isolated and depressed, not having people in, in my life who truly 
you know, could really understand me. So I, I think when I was looking at colleges, I, I wanted to find the best college that could fit uh, my key interests. And yes. I decided on sport management. But I realized once I got onto the campus I went to that unfortunately there was not a lot of services for those with disabilities. So it, it was not only the being the only person on my campus who I actually knew, but it was mm -hmm. also just thinking about how I could go about actually finding friends once I got to college. Yeah. So I want to go back to something. You said Absolutely. you made your first friend at age 14. How did you make this friend? Were you in activities? Was it a club? Or? Ironically enough, it was just a key interest that we oh, both had. Okay. We had uh, we, we loved basketball. Mm -hmm. And growing up, because autism so many times gives individuals a laser focus in certain interests. Yeah. Uh, growing up, I could tell you all 30 NBA teams and every single player in one of those teams. And one of my friends who I made was just a big basketball and sport fan. Mm -hmm. And we kind of just connected being able to just talk about Hall of Fame numbers from all these mm -hmm. athletes. And we just hit it off. And it didn't hit me until he said, I'm so glad to have a friend like you. And then I was like, wait, we're friends, because we never like even brought up the conversation yeah. before. So it was life changing and it made me want to try to pursue more friendships uh, throughout my high school experience. How do you think parents or guardians can help with the transition into college? One thing that I hope all parents realize is the importance of getting their kids to self-advocate for themselves, because once they get to college, a, if they disclose their disability, they're going to be given a form which basically discusses whether or not your parents have the right to actually be part of your education because you'll be an adult now. So everyone who turns 18, that's kind of mandated. Mm -hmm. So I would highly, highly encourage self-advocacy skills and being able to understand what accommodations might be available for you on campus and then which ones that you would actually like to go about, especially if you disclose your disability, whether it's extended time on test or getting your own private room for your testing or a recorder to have all your classes recorded, finding what your challenges are and then finding the appropriate accommodations and being able to self-advocate for them. Okay. And how did you pick the college that you attended? I know that you said that you were interested in sports management. Yeah. So was that the key? I, I was just obsessed with basketball. I was obsessed with sports. And I figured w when I was looking at colleges, I looked up this college called Seen Hall University in New Jersey, where I'm from. And they had a sport management program. And I was reading about all these amazing people who went from Scene Hall into sport broadcasting, who were actually part of major sporting teams. And I was thinking to myself, it's like, this would be awesome. I would love to do something like this in the future. So it kind of just went hand in hand. And uh, that really kind of just made it uh, what I wanted it to be. I, my first acceptance layer actually to go to college was from Scene Hall too. So that probably helped a little bit. <laughs> then did you prepare in any way when you decided to attend college? Honestly, I, I had a lot of conversations with my parents about it, but there wasn't really a blueprint kind of brought out to me on how to really prepare for college. College was always one of my biggest dreams growing up, but it was more just the fact like I get to go to college, I get to hang out with people, I get to go to classes, and it, it, it feels like your own independence a little bit. But I, I, think, I think it was a true, true struggle trying to find ways of actually preparing for college because nothing was brought up like job shadowing or actual like orientation programs when I was in high school to like bring me onto a college campus. And there were no AP courses at my high school either. So it was kind of just very black and white. This is high school, this is college. And there was really not enough preparation right yeah. in there for my transition. When you talked with your parents, like what did you guys talk about? We talked about that college would be a big change. It was more general in nature versus like, because of your autism diagnosis, you might have sensory challenges on campus. It was, it was never anything like that. It was just more on the lines of, do you want to live in a dorm for the first time? Do you want to disclose your disability? Uh, so we brought up questions like that, uh, but it, it in terms of just how to prepare myself for college, there really wasn't a, a blueprint for that. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about college. 
So the first question is, what were your aspirations when you went to college? Did you have a certain major or profession or job in mind? And what inspired you to choose the major or profession or job? So I know you talked about sports management yeah. again. So how did you, so you just loved basketball and? Yeah, I, so, so I was in sport management um, and uh, I was very focused on having a future job in a sport and entertainment business. So uh, one of my first internships ever was at CBS Sports in New York, and I was a researcher going through pronunciation guides, giving mm -hmm. them to all the <laughs> color commentary. And I just really loved meeting individuals like uh, Craig Anthony, and e like even my first day, I randomly like ran into Dan Marino and Sh Shannon Sharp as they were like leaving the elevator. And I was just like, all right, I'm home. This is where I need to be. Uh, and that kind of stayed for me for quite a while uh, until I realized what I really want to do is focus on autism advocacy and my career in public speaking. Okay. And then what did a typical day in college look like for you? Oh, goodness. Uh, it was very all over the place. Uh, I started out just uh, taking four classes because one thing that my parents and I did talk about was preparation and taking a lighter load to transition to college for the first time. So, nice. yeah, it was phenomenal advice. So we, we did that and I, it was such a weird situation going from five days of classes to just like having two or three days of classes. So it was a hard transition, especially when it came to time management originally. But as I got older uh, and got older and I got uh, my sophomore, or junior, uh, senior years, I, I really was able to manage my time a little bit easier, understanding I'm a night owl, not a 8.30 a.m type of <laughs> student. So uh, it, it, it definitely was just preparation, taking the time to really reflect on my freshman year and trying to work on it every single year after that. So after that, did you take mostly like night classes or evening classes? Yes, yeah. night classes all the way. I even took an online course, which I kind of regret at this point because of th three hours of discussion board at night, uh, but yeah, it's fine. Uh, but yeah, I, um, I, I took mostly night courses and uh, some in the afternoon courses as well. That was kind of my cup of tea. Okay. And then um, what was your living situation like in college? Did you have roommates or did you live by yourself? And then what guided you to make that choice? Oh, I. It was one to be independent for the first time. Uh, I had never lived anywhere outside my family's place for more than a week <laughs> before. So I was going on to a college campus with the hopes that I could truly inspire to be a little bit more independent. Uh, so I, I went into the freshman dorms my freshman year and I had two, two uh, roommates and we shared a bathroom. And one of the great things about my freshman year was I was able to get a disability single, which was uh, giving me the opportunity to have my own space, but then also have suite mates. So if, if a rough day happened, I could decompress. So a disability single was actually something that I asked for as part of my accommodations in college. And I think that was like one of the best things that could have possibly happened in my experience living in the dorms, uh, being able to be able to socialize when I want to, and then also have that time to decompress, focus on the homework and, um, yeah. Was that just specific to your college, like the disability single, or is that? You know what's funny? So a lot of campuses are doing it nowadays, uh, especially for those who have a disclosed uh, disability, who are registered as part of a disability support program. Uh, I, I've seen for other individuals who have things such as who have a hearing difficulties, they have bed shakers when the, there is a, a, a fire uh, happening, a fire alarm going off. Uh, being able to wake them up if they have difficulties listening. Uh, so I think our dorms are doing a slightly better job uh, now uh, to really focus on the individual. Yeah, to accommodate to them. Yeah. Is there something about the way you learn that you feel is different from the way others learn and what is the difference? I think for the most part, I, I really, if, if I'm interested in something, mm -hmm. I, I think we all have this, but if I'm really interested in something, I will be able to 
remember it so much easier than versus when I'm actually in a situation where I'm learning, for example, uh, that economics. I didn't want to do economics my freshman year. I was like, do I have to be in economics class? But it was like part of my common core. Anyways, long story short, I had uh, some challenges early on. Uh, if I wasn't interested in something, I kind of just left it off till the last second, which uh, originally my GPA was only like 3.2. Uh, my, my fall semester and I was kind of like, all right, I'm going to try to up it because I was also in an honors program at the time. So I realized that I needed to kind of backtrack to the reward systems that helped me growing up as a child in K through 12 and trying to trickle that into my college experience to try to do better in some of the classes that I wasn't necessarily interested in being in. And then um, what challenges do you think adults with autism face when they attend college? Oh, the biggest one I think is, well, there, there are many, but one that I see most common in the autism community is relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to connect with other people, not only girlfriend, boyfriend, but also friendships as well. Uh, I, I see a lot of them really wanting to branch out and try to find that connection, uh, especially when they're reaching uh, young adulthood. And it's, it's truly a challenge. Uh, I, I see many of them trying online dating from 18, 19 years old and really not being able to find a connection with the, the, their peers at the uh, college level. So I think relationships is one. And then the other one is trying to find the right accommodations because a lot of students I know uh, who have autism at the college level are doing extended time uh, and a private room for their classes. Uh, but I don't think sometimes they, they truly understand how many like different accommodations they possibly can to help progress their learning development. So I wish sometimes they, they would just take a minute, do, do a little bit more research and try to find accommodations that will not only help them when it's time to take a test, but also accommodations that will help them inside the classrooms. So kind of like self-advocate for themselves. Yep, absolutely. And then, um, so we kind of talked about this previously, do you think it's important for someone to disclose their diagnosis when they enroll into college? Why or why not? I think you said you disclosed yours. I did. Mm -hmm. I did. And I, originally, I wasn't sure if I was going to because I, I felt like I overcame a lot of my obstacles. And I, not having that understanding of accommodations, uh, mine is just a quick conversation with my parents. I was kind of thinking to myself, like, you know what? I could do this. I could do anything that anyone else does. And right away, though, I, I met a girl who was blind on my, on my college campus who uh, was actually severely bullied. And uh, one time she was in, she was trying to go to our chapel, our, our, our chapel on campus. And there was construction being done. And there was yellow tape <laughs> right there. And she fell over it. And there were two freshman boys, uh, I believe freshman boys right there, and they were laughing at her. And they, they wouldn't even bother to help her up. And I was thinking to myself, like, th this is not a community that I want to see and, and be part of. So I decided to disclose not only to get my own accommodations, but to also, in the hopes of sharing my own personal experiences growing up with autism, I could hopefully lead to more acceptance and less ignorance on my college campus. It's really amazing. Did you make friends when you disclosed your diagnosis? Do you think it was more? Um... It, it was very hit and miss originally. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of friendships, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. As I met more advocates on my campus uh, who had disabilities. Uh, but it was also very like top, taboo too. It, it, some, I, I remember being on one date and uh, literally w w within the first five minutes, I'd never met her before. And she, she asked me if I had seen the movie Temple Grandin in 2011. And I'm thinking to myself, you did your research and you're like, you, you, you know all this about me already. And uh, I, I don't know, sometimes I think there was, people are always, I, I feel like they mean well, but sometimes they might not necessarily uh, be able to really understand uh, what somebody might be uh, going through. Yeah. So. And then, um, did you find a support group on your college campus? I actually started uh, a student 
organization on my campus called Student Disability Awareness because I've realized that there are no uh, student government association related organizations, so student ran organizations. So I started a group to help kids with disabilities. Uh, we filed our paperwork in my fall and my spring freshman semester and it got accepted. And we started out with just like a few members, just like five to 10 members, just a handful. And then my senior year, uh, we had risen to almost 50. And uh, once, I, once I graduated with my undergraduate, uh, SCA stayed around uh, and is still around to this day. So uh, I kind of had to branch out and try to create a group uh, when there was really no group there. And that's something I hope uh, for people out there who might be watching this, if they, if they do have a disability or, or they do want to try to get more support on their college campus, they'll consider uh, start, trying to start a group to really advocate for this topic. Was it hard for you to start up this group, or did you find a lot, of, a lot of support when you were? I found a lot of educators who were interested. A lot of special education majors right away were like, we gotta do this, it makes perfect sense. Uh, because there were a lot of diversity clubs on campus already, there was nothing really truly for the disabled community. So lots of educators, lots of therapists, uh, majors as well, uh, jumping on board right away to help. Were you nervous taking on a leadership role, or was that? Oh, absolutely. I, well, I, originally I thought it was gonna uh, crash and burn. Uh, not, not, not because I was like, well, I, I thought that sometimes disabilities aren't really mentioned unless you have that personal connection. So I was, I was thinking a lot of the times being like a high school like jock, <laughs> you know, it's on the basketball team. Like I, I would never really talk about disabilities with any of my teammates. We would always be talking about sports and girls and all this. Uh, but I, I think the ability to kind of take myself out of this and really try to focus on disability advocacy made me spur to be as best a leader as I possibly could and try to branch out and, and be that leader for the first time on the college campus. Yeah. Um, so my other question is, do you think that students who have autism um, face particular challenges that other college students might not be aware of? And then what are some examples of that? Oh boy, uh, th there's a lot, and it, it, it all comes down to a few things. Um, accommodations, first off. When I was uh, at my uh, undergraduate, I had to go up to each one of my uh, professors and actually hand them a form saying that I needed reasonable accommodations. And in many universities, uh, the, the programs that are in place actually do that for the students. I actually had to self-advocate for myself right away. So not only was it like an additional time requirement because I would actually have to set up meetings with each one of the professors every semester, but then also um, actually writing and doing emails with the disability support group to actually make sure I was getting extended time on a test, to actually make sure I was getting a private room. Um, and it made, it made my courses like so much longer, it felt like, because I was doing all of this additional work when I, when I really wish there was something in place that could have helped a, a little bit with the communication. So I think that's one of the biggest ones. And then the, the other one, again, I, and I can't stress this enough, is the, the relationship aspect. Because I know so many of my mentees who have autism and special needs want to find love, and they and they want to find a connection with somebody else, and a lot of the times they're not really sure of how to actually go about that. They're not sure if they should actually disclose their disability to their partner or if they should just keep it quiet because they're worried about getting judged, and especially for young adults when disclosure sometimes is a huge issue, this could be something that could just lead to a lot of more challenges for them. So I think those are the two big ones I currently see today. Okay, and then um, were college instructor, instructors familiar with autism and how do they demonstrate they understood it? <laughs> I, I, I remember one story of, uh, I, I was in a uh, managerial accounting uh, class and I remember handing my form to that professor for the first time and <laughs> him saying I've never met a student on our campus who had a disability before this is very interesting and I was like wow this is I, I, I didn't expect yeah, that kind of 
kind of response. Um, so I, I think it was very hit and miss. I feel like a, a lot of the educational programs and the, and the therapy programs were super focused on it. But then the, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the rest of the college campus truly didn't understand disability, didn't understand autism. Uh, for many, actually three, three out of the four years during my undergraduate, we didn't have any World Autism Month events, no World Autism Awareness Day events in April. And I, I, I wish that, because when I was growing up, there was no World Autism Awareness Day and there was no uh, really awareness of Autism Awareness Month. So I, I really wish that that was something that the, the university could have provided, not only for me, but others who might be ch challenged with the discussion of self-advocating self for themselves and disclosing their disability. So would you talk to your professors about like having extended time on a test or did you go through the disability services. Oh to yes, kind of I had to go through every single bullet. So yeah. they they had like a one page form that okay. they, that they would have to sign, just basically saying you're going to get these specific accommodations. So I would have to go through every single one of them. And the funny thing was, most of the time they were like, "So extended time, what's that?" And other times, like, well, well, why do you need a room for y your classes? Not really understanding the perspective of sensory challenges and noises might bothering from uh, actual attention during the exam. So it was very hit and miss, yes. um, but there were, there was so much lack of awareness, which we really try to do with our student group, but also just in my in my focus on autism advocacy. And then. Um Oh, so I guess we kind of discussed this a little bit, but did your college instructors accommodate to your needs? If so, how? Well, some of them definitely did, uh, and, and I don't want to give a bad rap <laughs> to, to any of them. Uh, there, there were some who went above and beyond, uh, and it was, it was just the ones who truly took the time to understand what the accommodations meant towards my development. A lot of the times it, it felt like even if it was subconsciously it felt like professors were thinking like oh he's getting all these extra accommodations it's cheating and I wanted people to know that these this isn't something for me to cheat this is something for me to have the best academic progress that I possibly can so when I, I do graduate I can go into a career and actually succeed so I feel like there was a lot of professors who sometimes were like, wow, what, all these accommodations, no, none of the other students get these accommodations. And that was uh, something that was very difficult. But there were some amazing, amazing professors. I had a, uh, I was also in an honors program at the time focused on servant leadership. And I was one of the only individuals with a disability in our honor program. So. My uh, dean of leadership actually took the time to learn more about what autism was and really tried to ask questions. And I found that super, super helpful to me. What do you think sparked that interest in that dean? Was it just kind of? I, I think it was also, well, so my, my original first class in my undergrad was an oral communication class where we were asked to speak for three minutes impromptu on what we're passionate about. And this was actually just a few weeks, uh, a few weeks after I saw that situation with the girl who was blind, uh, tripping and being bullied. And I decided I wanted to just share for the first time about having autism. No one knew I had autism. And I was kind of like, I don't know how this is going to go. Am I going to hear like crickets? What are people going to think? But I got a standing ovation during that class. And then just a few days later, I decided to talk to my dean about my autism diagnosis and just tell him that sometimes it's gonna be challenging for me to communicate. Uh, other times I might need more help than other individuals in the honors program. And that kind of sparked him being like, well, he's in a leadership honors program. He has autism. He has overcome a lot of his obstacles. How can I make him the best version of himself? So. Do you think your professors kind of took that same approach though as well, kind of asking like why you needed all of these accommodations, but like were genuinely like curious about it, not thinking that it was like cheating? It, it was very 50-50. There, there were some who, uh, I think one thing that we need to do better 
at the university level is actually making sure we have our professors to the highest academic standards that they potentially could be. And that has a lot to do with diversity and making sure that we provide an education, not only to the students that, that, that we're focused on, but also to ourselves. And that we understand that in our society in the United States, we're in one of the most diverse times in our country, not only for those with disabilities. So being able to have lectures and being able to have a professional development focused on our disability community, I think could go a long way towards actually being able to defeat some of this stigma about accommodations overall. Okay. And then um, what are the things you struggled with the most when you attended college? So that's kind of... I, we kind I, of discussed a little. Yeah, it's it. It was really uh, just going through those accommodations and feeling like I had more coursework than most of my peers because I had to go through all of that. Uh, and it was a tough transition with time management too. I, th those were definitely the two biggest challenges. How did you work with like time management? Like, what did you do? Uh, originally, not much. I <laughs> it was I was very like oh, I know I don't have a class today. I'm going to play Ultimate Frisbee until 2 a.m. and then, you know, wake up at, at 10 and, you know, run to my class at 10.30. Uh, <laughs> I, I was very much the, the, the kid who was, like, just trying to get into every single possibility from, like, hangouts with friends. And I was really trying to branch out as much as I could uh, un until I realized that my, my, my grades weren't, up to par with where I, I, I need them to be. So that really made me look up and research time management, how to actually go about it. best thing in my life, Google calendars. Google calendars, America, are the best things that could have ever potentially happened to me. And being able to have that schedule, being able to get push notification on my phone to have actually tell me when I have to be at this next thing and this next thing, really technology and uh, research was pivotal. So just using your resources. Yeah. Okay. And then um, what is one of your favorite memories about college? Uh, one of my favorite memories about college, there are a lot. Uh, I, I think it was actually my graduation uh, during my undergraduate degree, being able to walk at my graduation. I wrote a poem called um, Prove Them Wrong. And it was based on all the educators in my past who told me that I wouldn't even graduate from high school one day. Um, and I, I wrote, I wrote a poem. Actually, it's not proved them wrong. It's this one's for you. And this one's for you was to every person who said I couldn't achieve excellence. And this one's for you. So uh, I, I think, because I walked and then I shared that poem the next day on my blog and it went viral uh, and, and it kind of opened a large conversation with the parents who were writing on Facebook and the parents who were writing on my blog and saying like wow there's possibilities in our autism community for those for the one in 59 who have autism okay. and then how do you think your college experience was different from the average college student uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I think, again, it's like that, that laser focus I had on some of my key interests. Some people would hear me just talk, 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 talk about basketball and talk, talk, talk about this and that. And, they, and a lot of the times they'd be like, all right, Carrie, you need to settle down, calm down a little bit. Don't focus on everything as, as much as you do. Uh, so I think that's one of the biggest things. The, 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 the key interest topic, I was like always in the gym trying to play with the Division One basketball team. I talked to them about sports and they're like, we don't even like sports as much as you like basketball. So I'm like, all right, okay, I understand it. Take a step back. I think that's one of the biggest things. Uh, but then also the accommodation part, because uh, for my college campus at the time, less than 1% of our our campus of about 5,500 5, undergraduates had a diagnosed disability. Oh, okay. So a lot of the times I understood why people weren't understanding accommodations because it was a large group of people who had never heard of this topic before. So I think those were some of the big things. And then what did you find to be essential for you to succeed in college, either academically or socially? Uh, honestly, reward systems, even to this day, being able to write down 
like what I was doing, how much time I had to spend. Because organization was a, a very big part on, on me succeeding early on. Uh, organizing and being able to write down like, all right, okay, you're gonna stay for three hours for this exam and then you get like 30 minutes to like play video game or go to the calf or just hang out. So I think that helped tremendously because uh, I was very distracted growing up as a kid and reward systems were just something that always tremendously helped me. And once I was able to integrate that into my college education, I think it helped tremendously to where I am today as a speaker as well. And then, since attending college, do you feel you are able to better self-advocate? Did you learn new strategies while attending college? I learned strategies in the concept that everyone has a unique story compared to the next person you're gonna meet. My strategies worked well for me, and I realized that they wouldn't necessarily work for everyone. So strategies such as reward systems and receiving reasonable accommodations. Um, so I think I was able to progress because of that. And that's some advice I would give to any student, regardless if they have a disability, being able to really identify who you are as an individual, what your strengths and challenges are, and just trying to live the life that you want. Because well, life is short, I'm telling you. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's important that we understand every possibility we have and then just go after what we want in this world. Okay. And then um, you, you've successfully attended and graduated from college a couple of times now. What was your motivation? Yeah. What was your motivation <laughs> to attend college? And what motivated you to pursue a doctoral, a doctoral degree? Uh, I think, so I've always had an interest in education. Mm -hmm. And after graduating with my master's degree in strategic communications, I was able to really get into the public speaking realm. I actually received a scholarship from my master's from the National Speakers Association to actually pursue this career in public speaking. So after I did that, I realized the more places I was going to, speaking about early access to care, transition to adulthood for those with autism, I realized that there was still a lot of ignorance in the places that I was going to. And what better way to help defeat ignorance than by providing an education? Uh, even with April being called Autism Awareness Month a lot of the times, we, I, I truly hope that by awareness and education, we can truly turn this month into Autism Acceptance Month. So that kind of inspired me and I realized that I wanted to go back to school to pursue my doctorate to really focus on actually being a college professor and have the opportunity to educate on those with special needs like myself. Uh, I also have a dear friend, uh, Dr. Stephen Shore, who is also an internationally known uh, public speaker on the autism spectrum. And he w is actually a professor at Adelphi University. And he, he kind of motivated me and inspired me uh, because of all the good work I know he was doing on his campus. So all that, really uh, made a huge uh, difference in why I wanted to do that. Was it easier the second time around going back to college? <laughs> well, the, the, well, the challenge was uh, going from, so uh, undergraduate, I had to attend all my classes. There were no, the, there was just one online class. My master's, half of it was online and half of it was in person. My doctorate was all online. So uh, when I mentioned earlier about like three hours of discussion board, that was for every single class uh, because most of the people in my program were educators themselves. So having the opportunity to have an online program seems so easy for them. And it seemed easy for me in the professional speaking world because I travel so much. Uh, but it was so, so challenging. And it, it, it truly made me understand the reward systems even more uh, and understanding how I need to stay tight with them with yes. three hours of discuss discussion board sometimes. <laughs> and do you think colleges are prepared to help students with autism? If not, what do you think might be their first steps? I think th there are some programs who are going above and beyond. I am in constant talks with groups out of Fairleigh Dickinson University in New Jersey who really truly try to support people with autism. I know campuses in Alabama, uh, that have tremendous, uh, actually a center for those with autism. So 
it really depends on the area because I know some rural areas definitely have a, a bit more of a challenge uh, than in other areas, especially with finding funding for things like an autism center. Um, I, but overall, I think we're doing a better job realizing that these kids are turning into adults. Um, I have a TED talk that I gave in 2013 called The Path of Autism to College, where I actually talk a lot about the, the need for more programs for those with autism, but then also the other aspect of educating our professors. So long story short, I think it's a work in progress. I think we have a long way to go, but I definitely see more and more campuses actually going about trying to provide resources and programs for them. So good. Yeah. Okay, so now my next question is, how do you advocate for your needs in your workplace? So I know you're a professional speaker, but how do you go about that even Ooh, now? it's it, it can be very hit and miss because uh, so many big businesses still, even to this day, focus on the bottom line. And one of the unfortunate things I, I see from a lot of businesses I speak to is that they think that reasonable accommodations for those with autism and other disabilities are going to affect their bottom line. When actually uh, research has indicated from groups such as the Department of Labor that actually indicate that more than half of accommodations that individuals receive cost nothing. So <laughs> long story short, I, I, I think that one recommendation I can have is truly understanding your business understand if your business has actually hired people with autism in the past, uh, if they have any diversity programs on uh, the, their location that are actually helping uh, employees uh, get hired with disabilities, uh, and really make up your mind uh, after that, because uh, even though it's you can't uh, not hire somebody because they have a disability. There's a lot of gray area in yes. there too. So what kind of community supports are there for individuals on the spectrum? And what has your experience with them been like? Well, one of the best is uh, Autism Society of America. And I don't mean to toot their own horn, but they have uh, actually uh, amazing affiliate chapters throughout the United States that are actually helping uh, individuals with autism and their family members today. Uh, if you just go to autismsocietyofamerica.org, there are an actual list of all the affiliate chapters and where you can find them and see if there's one in your area. Uh, being on the board for that group and seeing their impact being an organization that's been around for over 50 years to support the autism community has been tremendous. So their chapters are really paving the way. Uh, another great community program that I highly recommend for anyone watching at home is the ARC. The ARC uh, has an amazing perspective on those with disabilities and like the Autism Society of America, have a lot of affiliated chapters throughout uh, the United States as well. So those would be the two a huge ones that I would recommend. Uh, but then I would also recommend researching government officials who support the autism community because yeah, over the past uh, decade or so, we have received a lot of bipartisan support for those with autism in terms of especially focusing on support programs in our local communities. Okay, and then my last question is, what has motivated you to keep moving forward despite all the challenges that you've encountered? I think it's because I just want to live the best life I can. I, I, I get this question a lot, and I, 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 I sometimes say something cliche and sometimes I don't. But one of the things that I, I truly understand about myself is that I have goals and dreams just like anybody else. And regardless of what my autism diagnosis means to me, I just want to live the best life and the best quality of life I can. And that's only something I could hope for every single person, regardless if you have a disability. So the quote that I wrote up in a poem that I shared uh, when, when I was actually just getting into college called uh, Only If You Knew Me, I shared the fact that autism can't define me and I define autism. And I can only hope every single person who's living their life right now, regardless if you have autism or not, can go out there and define your lives and your journeys in the way that you best see it every single day. And stay motivated. That's great. Well, thank you. Anytime. <laughs>